In this video, I'll be discussing the order on the ordinals, supremums, and minimums of collections of ordinals. First of all, let's introduce the class of all ordinals. It's called ord. And it is the collection of every ordinal, every single von Neumann ordinal as introduced last time. But the thing is, this collection is too large to be a set. There are too many elements and it might not obey those axioms as we want it to. And so we call it a class. A class is a collection of sets. So all of the elements in ORD are sets, so it's a class. Classes still have axioms, it's just, I'm not going to write them out. And they're a lot less restrictive than, say, the axioms of set theory. Now, we can define an order on the ordinals like we did last time. We say x is less than y if and only if x is an element of y. So we can still have orders on classes. There are a couple properties of this order. If I have three elements, x, y, and z, in ORD, first of all, if x is less than y and y is less than z, that means that x is less than z. The second condition is that it either x is less than y, or x is equal to y, or y is less than x. These are just the properties you want out of an order. And they come equipped with this order. And you can check that for the von Neumann ordinals, this is true. Our first lemma is going to be proving the equivalence of this order to a different form. What we prove is that x is less than y if and only if x is a proper subset, so it's not equal to y. And this is for x and y an element of ORD. This is not true if only y is an ORD. Let's prove the forward direction. So we assume x is less than y. By the definition, this means that x is an element of y. So now let's suppose that z is an element of x. Let's use this fact right here and this fact right here so that I have z is an element of x and x is an element of y, which then means that z is an element of y. Basically meaning if z is an element of x, then z is an element of y which means that x is a subset of y. And then, of course, x cannot be equal to y because it's less than y, and this condition guarantees that these are all exclusive. So I can just add on that it's excluding y. The backwards condition, the converse, is also pretty easy. Well, if I have x, a proper subset of y. By number two, there's only three things that could happen. x is less than y, x could be equal to y, and y may be less than x. Well, guess what? This one right here immediately crossed off because right there we guarantee that it's not equal to it. This one right here, if y was, an, was less than x, that would mean that y would be an element of x, which then, by the fact that x is a subset of y, would mean that y is an element of y, which, if you remember, is against one of the axioms, contradiction. Basically meaning, we can cross that out and we get x is less than y. Next, let's discuss a theorem. This theorem is about classes of ordinals. So if I have A, a subset or subclass of ORD, this is an arbitrary collection of ordinals that need not be a set. It just needs to be a class. So for this subset, the first thing is that the 
union of all the elements in A, which for classes is usually written like this instead. Uh, I'm not sure why that notation is used, it just is for classes. This union is the supremum of A. So the supremum is the union. The second condition is that the intersection of all the elements in A is the minimum of A, not the infimum, because the intersection of A is going to be in A. Quick little side note, these will be used. That the union of A is equal to the set of ordinals such that there exists an A in A such that x is less than a. The reason for this is because each of these a's is the set of ordinals such that those ordinals are less than a. An ordinal is the set of things less than it. That's what we discussed last time, and so when you union all of them together, you get the set such that there exists one in the collection such that they're less than it. Similar logic applies. And we have that the intersection of A is the set of ordinals such that for every A an element of A, X is less than A. You can verify yourself that both of these are ordinals involving these two conditions, but just for the elements of them. It's not very hard at all. Clarification. It is only an ordinal when the class has an upper bound. If there's no upper bound, then the supremum will be the entirety of the ordinals class, which is not an ordinal. The first one, we prove by doing this. If A is an element of A, so it's some element of the collection, that means that A must be a subset of the union of A, due to the fact that somewhere in this collection, there's this set, and I'm just adding more elements to it over in A. So therefore, A is a subset of it. But it's not a strict subset, just so you know. It's not a proper subset. Which then, by lemma 1, that means that A is less than, remember it's not a proper subset, so I have to add an, an equal there, the union of A. That proves that it's an upper bound. Any element in the collection is less than or equal to it. Alright, the reason why this is the least upper bound is because if I have Z less than this, this z cannot be an upper bound, which I'll, I'm going to prove that right now. Because if z was less than this, that would mean that z is an element of it. Which means, by this definition of the set, there exists an a, an element of a, such that z is less than a. Oop, look at that, z is less than a for one of them, so it's not an upper bound. All right, the second part of this theorem. This one is a tiny bit more difficult. Suppose I have A an element of A. That means that A must contain the intersection of A. Due to the fact that somewhere in there, A is going to be in there, and then we're restricting it by intersecting it with other sets. So A must contain it. It's not a proper containment though. Which then, by lemma 1, A has to be bigger than, but because it's not proper, or equal to, the intersection of A. Now let's prove that this is the greatest upper bound, or that it's the minimum. Suppose this intersection were less than some Z. That would mean that Z is not an element of the intersection of A due to the fact that that right there is A being an element of Z, so Z cannot be an element of the intersection of A. Which means that it doesn't obey this property. So that means that there must exist an A, an element of A, such that Z is bigger than or equal to A. So it does the exact opposite of the condition we needed, because it's not an element of it. But there's the problem that there's an equal to. So let's suppose that there existed an A and element of A such that Z is equal to A and that for everything else, 
for every a in element of a, z is less than or equal to a. So there's just some a in a, so that z is equal to it. And otherwise, it's strictly less than it. Well then, let's suppose b is an element of z. That means, that means, that for all a in element of a, b is less than z is less than or equal to a. And then I can remove the middleman, and because it's a strict less than, I can keep that, so that b is less than a, for every a in element of a. That's just transitivity of the order. But this right here is the condition we need it to be for it to be in the intersection of A. So that means that B is an element of the intersection on A. So if B is in Z, then B is in the intersection. Well, that means that Z is a subset of the intersection of A. Well, that would mean that by this, that would mean that z is actually less than or equal to the intersection of a. But when we initially got our z, we made sure that it was the other way around. So that right there is a contradiction, basically meaning this isn't the case, and therefore z is not a lower bound, meaning that the intersection of a is the least lower bound. Now the reason why it is actually an element of it is for a very similar reason. Let's suppose it wasn't an element. Suppose the intersection on A is not an element of A. Well that would mean, this basically means that there does not exist an A in element of A such that the intersection of A is equal to A. That's just what we did last time. Which is equivalent to saying that for every a in element of a, intersection of a is not equal to a. That's just negating this um, quantifier. But then, because the intersection on a is less than or equal to a, and it's also a lower bound, that means that this must be strictly less than a. Correct? Well then, well that means this right here is just the condition for it to be an element of the intersection of A. So the intersection of A is an element of the intersection of A. Contradiction. Basically meaning, the intersection of A must be an element of A. This would also act as a substitute for it being the greatest upper bound. Some applications of this is to extend the ordinals that we already know except in a much easier way. Take, for instance, omega times 2. Originally, we used the axiom of replacement multiple times and the axiom of union. We used it multiple times. But now, what we can do is simplify this very much. All we need to do is use this theorem. That's it. Because if I take the union of omega, omega plus 1, all the way up until omega plus n, so on and so forth. I don't even need to verify that this is a set, or that the axiom of union would apply, because this is an ordinal, and it is bigger than all of the things in the collection. Clarification, the class needs to have an upper bound. You need to make sure that it has an upper bound, which in the cases I bring up, it obviously does. So this collection of ordinals, when I union all of them together, I get omega times 2. Because it is the lowest value, which is bigger than omega, and omega plus 1, and omega plus 2, and omega plus n. The first one that does that is omega times 2. Same thing with omega squared. We used a bunch of complicated axiom of replacements and axiom of unions, but now we can just use the theorem. It's equal to the union of omega, omega times 2, omega times 3, omega times n, all the way up into infinity. The supremum of all of those is omega squared. And 
epsilon naught, which is omega to the omega to the omega to the omega infinitely on, is simply the union of the set of omega, omega to the omega, omega to the omega to the omega, so on and so forth. So this simplifies the process of making new ordinals to an extent where it's just literally applying a theorem and that's it. And that's it! Oh yeah! Mm hmm!